Section 18 of Four Science Fiction Novellas Four Science Fiction Novellas by Harold Vincent Wanderer of Infinity, Part 2 We are here only as onlookers, the wanderer explained sadly, and can have no material existence here. We cannot enter this plane, for there is no gateway. Would that there were... Now they were over the city, and the sphere came to rest above a spacious flat roof where there were luxurious gardens and pools, and a small glass-domed observatory. A woman was seated by one of the pools, a beautiful woman with long golden hair that fell in soft profusion over her ivory shoulders and bosom. Two children, handsome and stalwart boys, were probably ten and twelve, romped with a domestic animal which resembled a fox sound of earth but had glossy short-haired fur and flippers like these of a seal suddenly these three took to the water and splashed with much vigor and joyful shouting the wanderer gripped bert's arm with painful force my home he groaned understand earthling this was my home these my wife and children destroyed through my folly destroyed, I say, in ancient days, and by my accursed hand when the metal monsters came. There was madness in the wanderer's glassy stare, the madness of a tortured soul within. Bert began to fear him. We should leave, he said. Why torment yourself with such memories? My friends, have patience, earthling. Don't you understand that I sinned and am therefore condemned to this torment? "'Can't you see that I must unburden my soul of this age's old load, "'that I must revisit the scene of my crime, that others must see and know? "'It is part of my punishment, and you, perforce, must bear witness. "'Moreover, it is to help your friends and your world that I bring you here. "'Behold!' "'A man was coming out of the observatory, "'a tall man with bronze skin and raven locks. "'It was the wanderer himself.' the wanderer of the past, as he had been in the days of his youth and happiness. The woman by the pool had risen from her seat and was advancing eagerly toward her mate. Bert saw that the man hardly glanced in her direction, so intent was he on an object over which he stood. The object was a shimmering bowl some eight or ten feet across, which was mounted on a tripod near the observatory and over whose metallic surface a queer bluish light was playing. It was a wordless pantomime, the ensuing scene, and Bert watched in amazement. This woman of another race, another age, another plane, was pleading with her man, sobbing soundlessly, wretchedly. And the man was unheeding, impatient with her demonstrations. He shoved her aside as she attempted to interfere with his manipulations of some elaborate mechanical contrivance at the side of the bowl. And then there was a sudden roaring vibration, a flash of light leaping from the bowl, and the materialization of a spherical vessel that swallowed up the man and vanished in the shaft of light like a moth in the flame of a candle. At Bert's side, the wanderer was a grim and silent figure. Misty and unreal when compared with those material, emotion-torn beings on the rooftop. The woman, swooning, had wilted over the rim of the bowl, and the two boys with their strange amphibious pet splashed out from the pool and came running to her side, wide-eyed and dripping. The wanderer touched a lever, and again there was the sensation as of a great page turned across the vastness of the universe. All was hazy and indistinct outside the sphere that held them, with a rushing blur of dimly gray-light forms. Beneath them remained only the bright outline of the bowl, an object distinct and real and fixed in space. It was thus I left my loved ones, the wanderer said hollowly. In fanatical devotion to my science, but in blind disregard to those things which really mattered. Observe, O oh man called Bert, that the bowl is still existent in the infradimensional space, the gateway, I left open to your traria. So it remained, while I, fool that I was, explored those planes of the fifth dimension that were all around us though we saw and felt them not. Only I had seen, even as your friend Tom has seen. And, like him, I heeded not the menace of the things I had witnessed. 
we go now to the plane of the metal monsters behold the sphere shuddered to the increased power of its hidden motors and another huge page seemed to turn slowly over lurching sickeningly as it came to rest in the new and material plane of existence here bert understood now the structure of matter was entirely different atoms were comprised of protons and electrons whirling at different velocities and in different orbits possibly some of the electrons in reverse direction to those of the atomic structure of matter in utraria and these coexisted with those others in the same relative position in time and in space ages before the thing had happened and he was seeing it now they were in the midst of a forest of conical spires whose sides were of dark glittering stuff that reminded bert of the crystals of carborundum before pulverizing for commercial use a myriad of deep colors were reflected from the sharply pointed piles in the light of a great cold moon that hung low in the heavens above them in the half-light down there between the circular basis of the cones weird creatures were moving like great earthworms they moved sluggish and with writhing contortions of their many-jointed bodies long cylindrical things with glistening gray hide like armor plate and with fearsome heads that reared upward occasionally to reveal the single flaming eye and massive iron jaws each contained there were riveted joints and levers wheels and gears that moved as the creatures moved darting lights that flashed forth from trunnion mounted cases like the searchlights of a battleship of earth great swiveled arms with grappling hooks attached they were mechanical contrivances the metal monsters of which the wanderer had spoken whether their brains were comprised of active living cells or whether they were cold calculating machines of metallic parts bert was never to know see the gateway the wanderer was saying they are investigating it is the beginning of the end of utaria all as it occurred in the dim and distant past he gripped bert's arm pointing a trembling finger and his face was a terrible thing to see in the eerie light of their sphere a sharply outlined circle of blue white appeared down there in the midst of the squirming monsters the sphere drifted lower and bert was able to see that a complicated machine was being trundled out from an arched doorway in the base of one of the conical dwellings it was moved to the edge of the light circle which was the bowl on that rooftop of utraria the same bowl a force area like that used by tom parker an area existent in many planes of the fifth dimension simultaneously an area where the various components of wave motion merged and became as one the gateway between planes the machine of the metal monsters was provided with a huge lens and a reflector and these were trained on the bowl wheels and levers of the machine moved swiftly there came an orange light from within that was focused upon lens and reflector to strike down and mingle with the cold light of the bowl a startling transformation ensued for the entire area within view was encompassed with a milky diffused brightness in which two worlds seemed to intermingle and fuse there were the rooftops of the city in utraria and its magnificent domes a transparent yet substantial reality superimposed upon the gloomy city of cones of the metal monsters jupiter bert breathed they're going through they are earthling more accurately they did thousands of them millions even as the wanderer spoke the metal monsters were wriggling through between the two planes their enormous bodies moving with menacing deliberation on the rooftops back in utraria could be seen the frantic fleeing forms of human-like beings the wanderer's people there was a sharp click from the control panel and the scene was blotted out by the familiar maze of geometric shapes the whirling dancing light forms that rushed madly past over the vast arch which spanned infinity where were you at the time asked bert awed by what he had seen and with pity in his heart for the man who had unwittingly let loose the horde of metal monsters on his own loved ones and his own land he stared at the wanderer the big man was standing with face averted 
hands clutching the rail of the control panel desperately. I, he whispered, I was roaming the plains, exploring, experimenting, immersed in the pursuits that went with my insatiable thirst for scientific data and the broadening of my knowledge of this complex universe of ours. Forgetting my responsibilities, unknowing, unsuspecting. You return to your home? Too late, I returned. You shall see. We return now by the same route I then followed. No, Bert shouted, suddenly panicky at the thought of what might be happening to Joan and Tom in the land of the Bardex. No, wanderer, tell me, but don't show me. I can imagine. Seen those loathsome big worms of iron and steel, I can well visualize what they did. Come now, have a heart, man. Take me to my friends before. Ah? Uh? The wanderer looked up, and a benign look came to take the place of the pain and horror which had contorted his features. It is well, O oh man called Bert. I shall do as you request, for now I see that my mission has been well accomplished. We go to your friends, and fear you not that we shall arrive too late. Your, your mission? Bert calmed immediately, under the spell of the wanderer's new mood. My mission throughout eternity— "'Earthling, can't you sense it? "'Forever and ever I shall roam in for a dimensional space, "'watching and waiting for evidence "'that a similar catastrophe might be visited on another land, "'where warm-blooded thinking humans of similar mold to my own "'may be living out their short lives of happiness or near happiness. "'Never again shall so great a calamity come to mankind anywhere "'if it be within the wanderer's power to prevent it. "'and that is why I snatched you up from your friend's laboratory. "'That is why I have shown to you the—' "'Me? Why me?' Bert exclaimed. "'Attend, O earthling, and you shall hear.' "'The mysterious intangibilities of the cosmos "'whirled by unheeded by either as the wanderer's tale unfolded. "'When I returned,' he said, "'the gateway was closed forever. "'I could not enter my own plane of existence.' The metal monsters had taken possession. They had found a better and richer land than their own, and when they had completed their migration, they destroyed the generator of my force area. They had shut me out, but I could visit Urtaria. As an outsider, as a wraith, and I saw what they had done. I saw the desolation and the blackness of my once fair land. I saw that, that none of my own kind remained. All. All were gone. For a time, my reason deserted me, and I roamed infradimensional space as a madman, self-condemned to the outer realms where there is no real material existence, no human companionship, no love, no comfort. When reason returned, I set myself to the task of visiting other planes where beings of my own kind might be found, and I soon learned that it was impossible to do this in the body. To these people I was a ghostly visitant, if they sensed my presence at all, for my roamings between planes had altered the characteristics of atomic structure of my being. I could no longer adapt myself to material existence in these planes of the fifth dimension. The orbits of electrons in the atoms comprising my substance had become fixed in a new and outcast oscillation interval. I had remained away too long. I was an outcast, a wanderer, the wanderer of infinity. There was silence in the sphere for a space, save only for the gentle whirring of the motors. Then the wanderer continued. Nevertheless, I roamed these plains as a non-existent visitor in so far as their peoples were concerned. I learned their languages and came to think of them as my own and I found that many of their scientific workers were experimenting along lines similar to those which had brought disaster to Urtaria. I swore a mighty oath to spend my lifetime in warning them, in warding off a repetition of so terrible a mistake as I had made. On several occasions I have succeeded, and then I found that my lifetime was to be for all eternity. In the outer realms time stands still, as I have told you, and in the plane of existence which now was mine, an extra-material plane, I had no prospect of aging or of death. My vow, therefore, 
is for so long as our universe may endure instead of for merely a lifetime for this i am duly thankful for i shall miss nothing until the end of time i visited plains where other monsters as clever and as vicious as the metal ones who devastated urtaria were bending every effort of their sciences toward obtaining actual contact with other planes of the fifth dimension and i learned that such contact was utterly impossible of attainment without a gateway in the realm to which they wished to pass a gateway such as i had provided for the metal monsters and such as that which your friend tom parker has provided for the bardex or spider men as you term them in interdimensional space i saw the glow of tom parker's force area and made my way to your world quickly but tom could not get my warning he was too stubbornly and deeply engrossed in the work he was engaged in the girl joan was slightly more susceptible and i believe she was beginning to sense my telepathic messages when she sent for you still and all i had begun to give up hope when you came on the scene i took you away just as the spider-men succeeded in capturing your friends and now my hope has revived i feel sure that my warning shall not have been in vain but objected bert you've warned me not the scientist of my world who is able to prevent the thing yes you the wanderer broke in it is better so this tom parker is a zealot even as was i a man of science thinking only of his own discoveries i am not sure he would discontinue his experiments even were he to receive my warning in all its horrible details but you o man called bert through your love of his sister and by your influence over him will be able to do what i cannot do myself bring about the destruction of this apparatus of his impress upon him the grave necessity of discontinuing his investigations you can do it and you alone now that you fully understand say you're putting it up to me entirely nearly so and there is no alternative i believe i have not misjudged you you will not fail of that i am certain for the sake of your own kind for the love of joan parker you will not fail and for me for this small measure of atonement it is permitted that i make or help to make possible no i'll not fail take me to them quick bert grinned understandingly as the wanderer straightened his broad shoulders and extended his hand there was no lack of substantiality in the mighty grip of those closing fingers again the sphere's invisible motors increased speed and again the dizzying kaleidoscope of color swept past them more furiously we will now overtake them your friends said the wanderer in the very act of passing between planes overtake them bert mumbled i don't get it at all this time traveling it is over my head a mile it isn't time travel really explained the wanderer we are merely closing up the time-space interval moving to the precise spot in the universe where your friend's laboratory existed at the moment of contact between planes with your world and that of the bardex we shall reach there a few seconds after the actual capture no chance of missing bert watched the wanderer as he consulted his mathematical data and made new adjustments of the controls not the slightest it is calculated to a nicety we could if we wished stop just short of the exact time and would see the recurrence of their capture but only as unseen observers you cannot enter the plane as a material being during your own actual past for your entity would then be duplicated of course i cannot enter in any case but moving on to the instant after the event as we shall do you may enter either plane as a material being or move between the two planes at will by means of the gateway provided by tom parker's force area do you not now understand the manner in which you will be enabled to carry out the required procedure hmm bert wasn't sure at all but this moving through time he asked helplessly and the change from one plane of oscillation to another they're all mixed up what have they to do with each other 
all five dimensions of our universe are definitely interrelated and dependent one upon the other for the existence of matter in any form whatsoever you see but here we are the motors slowed down and a titanic page seemed to turn over in the cosmos with a vanishing blaze of magnificence directly beneath them glowed the disk of blue-white light that was tom's force area the sphere swooped down within its influence and came to rest make haste the wanderer said i shall be here in the gateway though you see me not bring them here speedily on the one side bert saw familiar objects in tom's laboratory on the other side the white cliff and the pitchy sea of the bardeck realm and the cage of the basket weave between, with his friends inside struggling with the spider man. It was the instant after the capture. Joan, Tom, Bert shouted. A side of the sphere had opened, and he plunged through and into the Bardak plain, to the inky surface of the sea, fully expecting to sink in its forbidding depths. But the stuff was an elastic solid springy under his feet and bearing him up as would an air inflated cushion he threw himself upon the cage and tore at it with his fingers the whimpering screams of the spider man were in his ears and he saw from the corner of his eye that other of the tortoise-like mounds were rising up out of the viscid black depths dozens of them and that hundreds of the bardacks were closing in on him from all directions weapons were in their hands and a huge engine of warfare like caterpillar tractor was skimming over the sea from the cliff wall with a great grinding and clanking of its mechanisms but the cage was pulling apart in his clutches as if made of reeds with joan in one encircling arm he was battling the spider-men driving swift short jabs into their soft bloated bodies with devastating effect and tom recovering from the first surprise of his capture was doing a good job himself his flailing arms scattering the bardecks like ninepins the wanderer and his sphere both doomed to material existence only in infradimensional space had vanished from sight a bedlam rose up from the reinforcing hordes as they came in to enter the force area but bert sensed the guiding touch of the wanderer's unseen hand heard his placid voice urging him and in a single leap was inside the sphere with the girl with joan safely in the wanderer's care he rushed out again for tom then followed a nightmare of battling those twining tentacles and the puffy crowding bodies of the spider-man wrestling tactics and swinging fists were all that the two earthlings had to rely upon but between them they managed to fight off a half score of the bardecks and work their way back into the glowing force area it's no use tom gasped we can't get back sure we can we've a friend here in the force area tom parker staggered his strength was giving out no no bert he moaned i can't you go on leave me here not on your life bert swung him up bodily into the sphere as he contacted with the invisible metal of its hull kicking off the nearest of the spider-men he clambered in after the scientist the tableau then presented in the sphere's interior was to remain forever imprinted on bert's memory though it was only a momentary flash in his consciousness at the time the wanderer calm and erect at the control panel his benign countenance alight with satisfaction tom parker pulling himself to his feet clutching at the big man's free arm his mouth opened in astonishment joan seated at the wanderer's feet with awed and reverent eyes upturned there is no passing directly between the planes one must have the force area as a gateway and besides a medium such as the cage of the bardex the orange light of the metal monsters or sphere of the wanderer bert knew this instinctively as the sphere darkened and the flashing light forms leaped across the blackness the motors screamed in rising crescendo as their speed increased then abruptly the sound broke off into deathly silence as the limit of audibility was passed against the brilliant background of swift color changes and geometric light shapes that so quickly merged into the familiar blur 
Bird saw his companions as dim, wraith-like forms. He moved toward Joan, groping. Then came the tremendous thump, the swinging of a colossal page across the void, the warping of the very universe about them, the physical torture and the swift rush through Stygian inkiness. Farewell. A single word, whispered like a benediction in the wanderer's mellow voice, was in Bird's consciousness. He knew that their benefactor had slipped away into the mysterious regions of intradimensional space. Raising himself slowly and dazedly from where he had been flung, he saw they were in Tom's laboratory. Joan lay over there white and still, a pitiful crumpled heap. Panicky, Bert crossed to her. His trembling fingers found her pulse. A sobbing breath of relief escaped his lips. She had merely swooned. Tom Parker, exhausted from his efforts in that other plane and with the very foundations of his being wrenched by this passage through the fifth dimension, was unable to rise. Only semi-conscious, his eyes were glazed with pain, and incoherent moaning sounds came from his white lips when he attempted to speak. Bert's mind was clearing rapidly. That diabolical machine of Tom's was still operating, the drone of its motors being the only sound in the laboratory as the inventor closed his mouth grimly and made a desperate effort to raise his head. But Bert had seen shapes materializing on the lighted disc that was a gateway between planes, and he rushed to the controls of the instrument. That starting lever must be shifted without delay. Don't! Tom Parker found his voice. His frantic warning was a hoarse, whistling gasp. He had struggled to his knees. It will kill you, Bert. Those things in the force area, partly through. The reaction will destroy the machine and all of us if you turn it off. Don't, I say. What then? Bert fell back appalled. Hazily, the steel prow of a war machine was forming itself on the metal disc. Caterpillar treads moved like ghostly shadows beneath. It was the vanguard of the Bardeck hordes. Can't do it that way. Tom had gotten to his feet and was stumbling toward the force area. Only one way, during the change of the oscillation periods. Must mingle other atoms with those before they stabilize in our plane. Must localize annihilating force. Must. What was the fool doing? He'd be in the force area in another moment. Bert thrust forward to intercept him, saw that Joan had regained consciousness and was sitting erect, swaying weakly. Her eyes widened with horror as they took in the scene, and she screamed once despairingly and was on her feet tottering. Back, Tom Parker yelled, wheeling. Save yourselves. Bert lunged toward him but was too late. Tom had already burst into the force area and cast himself upon the semi-transparent tank of the Spider-Men. A blast of searing heat radiated from the disk, and the motors of Tom's machine groaned as they slowed down under tremendous overload. Joan cried out in awful despair and moved to follow, but her knees gave way beneath her. Moaning and shuddering, she slumped into Bert's arms, and he drew her back from the awful heat of the force area. Then, horrified, they watched as Tom Parker melted into the misty shape of the Bardeck war machine. Swiftly his body merged with the half-substance of the tank and became an integral part of the mass. For a horrible instant, Tom, too, was transparent, a ghost shape writhing in a ghostly throbbing mechanism of another world. His own atomic structure mingled with that of the alien thing, and yet for a moment he retained his earthly form. His lean face was peaceful in death, satisfied, like the wanderers when they had seen him last. A terrific thunderclap rent the air, and a column of flame roared up from the force area. Tom's apparatus glowed to instant white heat, then melted down into sizzling liquid metal and glass. The laboratory was in sudden twilight gloom, save for a tongue of fire that licked up from the force area to the panel ceiling. On the metal disc, now glowing redly, was no visible thing. The gateway was closed forever. 
what more fearful calamity might have befallen had the machine been switched off instead bert was never to know nor did he know how he reached his parked flivver with jonah limp sobbing bundle in his arms he only knew that tom parker's sacrifice had saved them had undoubtedly prevented a horrible invasion of earth and that the efforts of the wanderer had not been in vain the old house was burning furiously when he climbed in under the wheel of his car he held joan very close and watched that blazing funeral pyre in wordless sorrow as the bereaved girl dropped her head to his shoulder a group of men came up the winding road a straggling group running the loungers from the village in the forefront was the beardless youth who had directed bert and bringing up the rear limping and scurrying was the old man they had called gramp he was puffing prodigiously when the others gathered around the car demanding information and the old fellow with the thick spectacles talked them all down what'd i tell you he screeched didn't i say they was queer doin's up here didn't i say the devil was here with his imps and the thunder you're a passel idiots like i said the roar of bert's starting motor drowned out the rest but the old fellow was still gesticulating and dancing about when they clattered off down the winding road to Lenville. An hour later Joan had fallen asleep, exhausted. Night had fallen, and as mile after mile of smooth concrete unrolled beneath the flivver's wheels, Bert gave himself over to thoughts he had not dared to entertain in nearly two years. They'd be happy, he and Joan, and there'd be no further argument. If she still objected to living on the fruit farm, that could be easily managed. They'd live in Indianapolis, and he'd buy a new car, a good one, to run back and forth. If, when her grief for Tom had lessened, she wanted to go on with laboratory work and such, well, that was easy, too. Only there would be no fooling around with this dimensional stuff. She had enough of that, he knew. He drew her close with his free arm, and his thoughts shifted, moved far out in infradimensional space to dwell upon the man of the past who had called himself Wanderer of Infinity, he who would go on and on until the end of time, until the end of all things, watching over the many worlds and planes, warning peoples of human-like mold and emotions wherever they might dwell, helping them, atoning throughout infinity, suffering end of section 18 and of four science fiction novellas by harold vincent